Imagine a shape. Imagine a color. Imagine virtually any form that life might assume, and you'll find it in the ocean. The sea is home to living diversity that transcends imagination. Diversity that has inspired our creativity and intellect since we first became human. In 1853, master glass artisan Leopold Blaschka was sailing from Europe to the United States. The wind died off the Azores, leaving the ship becalmed for two weeks. Jellyfish and other creatures moving past the rail entranced Leopold. He drew them, determined to later capture the shining essence of the creatures in glass. Marine biologist Drew Harvell curates a collection of Blaschka glass masterpieces at Cornell University, where she's a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I've spent my life studying these details of invertebrate form and function, and it continues to amaze me some of the details that I learn from looking at the models. The Blaschka models were crafted not just for aesthetics, but to accurately represent individual species. Each color and shape, from red tentacle to blue eye spot, represents underlying biology. Every living form has function, many essential to the survival of the species. And each species has a role in maintaining a healthy ocean. Having intact biodiversity in our marine ecosystems provides proper functioning of those ecosystems and also insurance against environmental change. Leopold Blaschka would have had difficulty imagining the changes to come to the ocean over the next century and a half. We've exponentially expanded human population, knowledge, and capabilities. But in the process, we've put the living diversity of the ocean at risk. The Blaschka models provide a time capsule to measure the ocean of today against that of Leopold's time. As complex and delicate as the glass models are, the living things they represent and the ecosystems these organisms are part of are infinitely more so. Now, scientists, artists, policymakers, everyone has a brief window of opportunity to take the knowledge and tools that we've acquired since Blaschka's time and apply our collective imagination to protecting this priceless, fragile legacy. Leopold's son, Rudolf, born in 1857, was raised in a glassmaking tradition called lamp working. Lamp working goes back about 2,500 years, and it's a pretty simple technology. We have examples that go back more than 1,500 years to the 3rd and 4th century AD. Around 1,000 years ago, Venice became the center of glassmaking. They did glass blowing and also lamp working, flame working. The Blaschka family actually dates back to about the 13th century as makers of glass in Venice. When Leopold Blaschka moved his family to Dresden, he took on a new career. He moved from costume jewelry and making glass eyes to making these beautiful models of flowers and marine invertebrates. He took lamp working skills to heights of proficiency and expertise and beauty that had never been reached before and have never been reached since. Leopold Blaschka was once asked, how do you make these exquisite, beautiful models? He said, Eh, there's no magic machine that you can just squeeze the glass out and produce these delicate things. If you are to be a great glassmaker, you need a great grandfather who had great skill and interest that he would pass down to his son. And then each generation, the skill would pass down and increase every generation. And that's why Rudolph is the best of us all. 
Rudolf Blaschke and his father, Leopold Blaschke, are two of the greatest glass artists stroke makers to ever walk the face of the earth. The 1800s were years of great interest in natural history, offering the Blaschkes a profitable means of indulging their passion for modeling marine organisms. Naturalist explorers such as Charles Darwin were expanding and fundamentally altering humanity's perception of the natural world. Their discoveries were shared in museums and universities, being founded throughout the Americas and Europe, such as in what is now the National Museum of Ireland. The key thing for us with the Blaschke collection is it allowed the curator in the 1870s to start filling all the gaps in between the various other animals were on display. Because glass models allow you to put on display both microscopic animals that are blown up to a much larger scale, but also a lot of soft-bodied organisms, particularly marine creatures, that don't preserve properly. You can assemble a whale skeleton, but if you want to show a jellyfish and how it works, you really need to model that, because a jellyfish preserved in alcohol is a hard, white, rubbery lump. And if you want to show the majesty of the color and the full shape of a bell of a Medusa in motion, you have to do that through model making. You had just had the major flowering in the middle of the century of the Industrial Revolution, particularly in Europe and also in North America, and the advent of steam travel by road and by rail. The printed word became much more widely available. It was much cheaper to produce books and much cheaper to spread ideas. In addition to their own watercolors, Rudolf and Leopold used illustrations by Goss, Haeckel, and other naturalist artists of the time to hone the accuracy of the models. The father and son team produced thousands of handmade glass sea creatures for museum and university collections all over the world. In 1882, Andrew Dixon White, the first president of Cornell University, authorized purchase of over 570 Blaschke models for use in teaching marine biology. Fast forward to the 1950s. Advances in transportation allow students of the marine sciences more direct access to ocean environments. The Aqualung enables people to bring cameras and lights underwater, experiences shared widely via television. Cornell's Blaschka models, apparently obsolete as teaching tools, are forgotten. In 1957, a young faculty member named Thomas Eisner happens on the collection and moves it to the renowned Corning Museum of Glass for safekeeping. For the next three decades, these glass squid, jellyfish, and other creations lie in storage. When Dr. Harvell joins the Cornell faculty in 1986, she champions restoring and using the antique Blaschka collection to engage people in marine science and conservation. It really is a spineless tree of life from the lowest, most basal or primitive forms like the sponges and the tenophores through all of the jellyfish, corals, moving then up to the mollusks, sea slugs, octopus and squid. Then there's an amazing diversity of worms that populate the middle, flatworms, Segmented worms are super high pressure annelid worms, the beautiful feather dusters, all the way up to the apex, starfish, some of the chordates or sea squirts, which are our closest relatives. We're finding that this collection really is a lens through which people can look at the living biodiversity and open their eyes to the wonder. Given the fragility of the glass, another type of lens is needed to widely share these remarkable creations. Filmmaker David Brown documents undersea wildlife of all kinds and sees this as an opportunity to focus attention on creatures that are often ignored. It's the little things that they got so beautifully, the, the nudibranchs, the jellyfish, little cephalopods, things that most people just don't ever really pay attention to. The quest here is to go back and film the living biodiversity that underlies our glass pieces. 
This was a quest that arose one night when I was giving a talk. David came up and said, hey, let's make a film. Let's go back and look for the living representatives and actually see whether this time capsule idea can show us changes in the biodiversity through time. In today's high-speed, high-tech world, perhaps these handcrafted creations from another time can still help inspire people to act on behalf of the ocean. Why not take that same type of pioneering ingenuity that the Blaschkas displayed in putting together these incredible glass models? Take that kind of energy, that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of passion for the natural world and apply it to helping the natural world. To be effective ambassadors for their living counterparts, the Blaschka glass sea creatures need to be in good condition. The process of restoring Cornell's collection is a lengthy and complicated one, as the effort to bring back one charismatic glass piece demonstrates. This model of Octopus vulgaris, the common octopus, was among the damaged specimens in the collection when it was rediscovered in 1957. It is now undergoing restoration back in New York. Over the last 25 years, we've been restoring the collection. My partner in this has been Elizabeth Brill. The Blaschkas made the different parts of the animal and then they glued them together. The legs are made independently and then twisted together with some wire in the middle. Then the head is put on, the eyes are put on, and then the webbing material is put on. Though damaged, the glass vulgaris is a beautiful sculpture and the team makes documentation of the living animal a top priority. This is a mystery to me. Time, I've seen... time takes its toll on the Blaschka creations, yeah. and conservators at the Corning Museum of Glass employ their extensive expertise and every available technology to stabilize parts of the Cornell collection. The amount of work that they produced is absolutely astounding. The Blaschkas are probably some of the most fragile objects that I've worked on. One of the things that makes them so fragile is the use of extremely thin glass. These were teaching collection materials. The students would handle them. Sweaty hands is enough to remove some surface. One primary conservation goal is to not remove original material. But knowing what they used both as glass, as frameworks, adhesives, coatings, pigments and paints is critical to the conservation treatment. As the glass animals have lain protected in climate-controlled storage, the ocean home of the organisms they represent is changing at an unprecedented rate. Overfishing, pollution, and coastal development have a tremendous impact on marine species and ecosystems. Decades of fossil fuel combustion add tons of CO2 to the atmosphere, trapping heat, and the sea is warming. The ocean is also absorbing CO2, rendering the water increasingly acidic, making it difficult for some marine life to build shells. Through our amazing inventiveness, we've accidentally triggered an extinction crisis. It's already changed so much, and I think everybody's aware of it on some level, but most people feel it's just too big. Drew works on the front lines of scientific inquiry aimed at keeping the ocean healthy. Her research and teaching takes her all over the world, and the team sets out to document Blaschka organisms and their relatives wherever her work takes her, beginning in Hawaii. It's going to always be at least one of you that's going to want to They get find and to film Hawaii. ambassadors of several groups represented in Cornell's Blaschka collection, including brittle stars, flatworms, and sea cucumbers. They don't find Octopus vulgaris, the so-called common octopus, but close relatives provide two highlights of the expedition. Drew's first close encounter with an octopus is on a night dive off Hawaii's Big Island, where they film the ornate octopus, Octopus ornatus. It's been this Blaschka project that's exposed me to cephalopods, and it has just been the best adventure, the most exciting privilege for me to spend time with these animals underwater. A Hawaiian dawn brings another cephalopod, this time the day octopus, 
Octopus cyaneae. As both predator and prey in oceanic food webs, cephalopods use incredible camouflage, dexterity, and intelligence to survive. The cyaneae blasts a cloud of ink in an attempt to confuse Drew. She gives the octopus its space until it calms down, allowing her a closer look. But while cousins, neither of these are an exact match to Cornell's octopus vulgaris. The Shoals Marine Laboratory off the New England coast, run by Cornell and the University of New Hampshire, is a well-equipped marine research station. It's also one of Drew's summer teaching sites, and the team takes advantage of the opportunity to film some of the smaller organisms that are matches to Blaschka glass. Tubularia is a relative of the jellyfish, while Botrylis is a sea squirt. But again, the common octopus is nowhere to be found. They do find a tiny, delicate species of sea slug, or nudibranch, called Phasalina bostoniensis. Nudibranchs are remarkable in both appearance and behavior, and Drew's most remote worksite holds a dazzling array of these beautiful creatures. Indonesia, heart of the Coral Triangle, is the most biologically diverse undersea environment on Earth. Volcanic islands jut from the sea floor, creating magnificent current-bathed walls, home to a staggering array of life. It's the perfect place to illustrate how form follows function in nudibranchs. A lot of these nudibranchs are warningly colored, and that's because they're loaded with toxic chemicals that will make a fish get sick or even die if they eat them. Other nudibranchs go the other way. They're mimetic and they match their prey, and so they're perfectly cryptic. These are simply snails without a shell. And so instead of having a shell for defense, they're often using these chemical defenses. Some of the work that we've done in my lab with chemical ecology involves drug discovery work and things like anti-inflammatory chemicals, antiviral, antibacterial. The patterns and colors of each species represent different ways in which these chemical defenses have evolved, potential discoveries waiting to be made on intact coral reefs. Drew works in Indonesia as part of a multinational effort to identify the healthiest reefs for consideration to be set aside by the Indonesian government as marine protected areas. Marine protected areas, or MPAs, are among the most powerful policy tools that people have created to help safeguard marine biodiversity. MPAs can provide sanctuary for entire ocean communities, areas from which depleted populations of marine life may be restored. But it's not only benefiting for marine conservation and protecting biodiversity on the spots, but actually giving opportunity for the fishermen to get more fish, to get more money. But MPAs are only effective if enough resources are available to enforce sanctuary boundaries. There's violation of even those parks in the sense of dynamite fishing. We've just had some really disappointing days of diving to find areas that are well shattered, the reef just blown to pieces. A stick of dynamite is tossed onto a coral reef, and the fish that float to the surface after the blast collect it. A habitat is destroyed for a handful of fish. Those corals are fragile, and when you dynamite them, they shatter in the same way that our glass invertebrates would shatter. Making resources available to designate and enforce marine protected areas worldwide is a key part of the solution to the loss of oceanic biodiversity. Nighttime on an Indonesian reef reveals a bewildering array of creatures, from sleepy fish to hunting sea snakes. David's video lights punctuate the bizarre and beautiful forms and colors of the night reef. On one night dive, the team is surprised by swarms of palola worms, another creature the Blaschkas model, emerging from the sea floor in an annual spawning event. On the last night dive of the Indonesia trip, 
They add another species of cephalopod to the growing archive of footage, this time a stumpy cuttlefish. Until very recently, the general public would have rarely, if ever, encountered this tiny, reclusive creature. At the Monterey Bay Aquarium, modern technology, coupled with today's knowledge of biology and chemistry, has resulted in successful captive breeding and display of stumpy cuttlefish and a variety of other marine life. This wouldn't have been possible even a few decades ago. It's an example of the speed at which we're progressing in both knowledge of biology and technological capability. In Monterey, the living inspirations for many of Blaschka's models thrive in artificial environments, allowing people to see living pieces of marine ecosystems from around the world. But as wonderfully presented as these pieces are, they're still only fragments of the tapestry that makes up ocean ecosystems in the wild. These ecosystems are experiencing extreme stress as complex checks and balances that have evolved over a millennia shift in response to rapid change in the sea. In 2013, sea stars off the western seaboard of the Americas begin to die and Drew is part of an urgent scientific effort to figure out what's happening to them. We had no idea at the time what this was going to turn into. We're well over a body count of 20 species. The scale of the mortality is from Alaska to Mexico. And what we found is that at warmer sites, we had higher levels of mortality in our stars. And then in lab experiments, we were able to confirm that at warmer temperatures, stars died at a much higher rate. Keystone species are those that have a disproportionate impact on their community. In the ocean, the ochre star was coined by Bob Payne as being a keystone species based on the huge impact of removing it. We know that the ochre star is a keystone species. Removing it has huge impacts. We know that many of the other stars are also keystones in the sense that they have a large impact on the balance of marine ecosystems. To remove them all is going to be the impact of the century. While Drew is consumed with the mysterious deaths of the sea stars, David takes a crew to the Mediterranean in search of more matches to Cornell's Blaschka glass models. It's a key location to find and film the real things. Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka collected a lot of their specimens in the Mediterranean Sea. Overfishing, pollution, and onshore development have all taken their toll on the cradle of Western civilization. David selects two marine protected areas in southern Spain to explore, hoping that they've provided sanctuary for undersea life. The team finds a rich assortment of many matches to Blaschka models. Every dive reveals colorful nudibranchs, cryptic cephalopods, and graceful anemones. They explore a shipwreck that went down in 1855 about the time that Leopold Blaschka was on his ocean voyage. The Isabella, a two-masted brig, was carrying a load of marble when she sank in a storm. She carried a tombstone that was never delivered, testament to an era in which the ship was lost. The wreck is coated in Mediterranean feather duster worms and snake locks anemones, both subjects of Blaschka models. A cuttlefish, also a Blaschka match, is perched in the sand as if waiting to guide them over the exposed timbers of the deck. In the protected Mediterranean locations, the team at last encounters the common octopus, a perfect match to the glass specimen at Cornell. Nearly every dive yields an encounter with at least one of these intriguing creatures. Back in New York, Elizabeth Brill has cleaned Cornell's vulgaris. The body is cracked, and one eye was found loose in the bottom of the box in which it was stored. She gently installs the eye, but the larger crack is not fixable without further analysis. 
Drew and Elizabeth carefully add the partially restored glass model to the display case. Like sea stars, the octopus is an iconic sea animal. As the situation with the sea stars demonstrates, we can't afford to take any living thing for granted in our changing ocean. People of the Blaschka's time were largely unaware of the dangers posed by technologies to come, dazzled by the wonders the modern age offered. The fossil fuel-powered industrial revolution dramatically increased our ability to travel, to explore, and to communicate, paving the way for the digital revolution that continues to transform our lives. Fossil fuel combustion has also altered the temperature and chemistry of the sea. We're in a race between our newfound capabilities and the long-term damage that has been done to our biosphere. Change is the basis of natural selection, a process that most creatures can only respond to with instinct. We're different. Able to calculate, predict, plan, and innovate. We now have more trained and creative minds available to use our remarkable tools than ever before. The scientific network that Drew is part of makes incredibly fast progress in identifying the culprit that is killing sea stars. My colleague Ian Hewson was able to so quickly provide evidence for a candidate virus as the causative agent of this outbreak. In the space of three or four months, he was able to pinpoint the causative virus using this really highly technical sequence-based genomics technology. This just couldn't have been done 20 years ago. We would not have had the technology. So it's a matter of pulling together the will and harnessing that technology to bring back some of our biodiversity. The public really cared that this big group of our most iconic intertidal critters was disappearing and dying on their beaches. And that public interest was parlayed into development of the Marine Disease Emergency Act of 2014 to provide funds for mobilizing action in a case where our biodiversity is affected by an infectious agent. In the Blaschka's day, people didn't have the scientific knowledge or the technology to even be aware of the scale of the sea star epidemic let alone the ability to craft a response. What they did have was curiosity, creativity, and ingenuity. These defining traits of our species and the collective will to use them in the service of a sustainable future offer hope that the biodiversity that inspires and supports us all will continue. The quest to document the living treasures upon which the works of the Blaschkas are based has just begun, but the results to date are encouraging. There is still so much life, so much hope. It will take every mind, every hand, every heart, and all of our collective imagination, but we can, we must imagine our way to a sustainable future for the ocean, ourselves, and generations to come.